Hello and welcome back to the WB Accessibility Day, um, one o'clock a.m. UTC um, uh, session. If you have any questions, our uh, chat moderator Kayla will be answering them. So please put the questions that you have for our speaker. Um, please remember that we are a welcoming community and there is a code of conduct in force during this entire event. And you can find slides and Twitter links and all the information on our website at wpaccessibilityday.org. Um, our speaker right now is um, Adam. Um, Adam is a web developer at the University of Connecticut, or UConn, in the role um, at the Office of University Communications. He specializes in WordPress application development and web accessibility. He's also been on the accessibility and diversity committees at UConn. Um, these include UConn's Innovation and Communication Technology Task Force and University Communications Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. When he's not working, he enjoys reading, martial arts, and spending time with his family. So it's my pleasure to welcome Adam and his talk, Accessible Navigation from Scratch. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me see if I can get my screen shared. Make sure this works correctly. And I think that should do it. Okay, excellent. So uh, thank you very much for that terrific introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here with me. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed everything so far and learned a lot from the other presenters today. So the web team in our office focuses on top level and strategic marketing sites, uh, such as uconn.edu, uh, which is our main university website, our regional campus websites, and hospital network. Uh, and as you can imagine, these get a lot of traffic and we need to make sure that they are as accessible and, um, and welcoming as possible to everyone who visits. A few years ago, um, the World Accessibility Day New England Conference was held at the university. Pretty much everyone from our office's web team attended. As the conference went on, uh, it became very obvious very quickly how much work we needed to do. One of the things we looked at on our sites was the main navigation components. As a state institution, we had some pretty specific requirements. For instance, I think that at the time we were still supporting Internet Explorer 10, and we also wanted to make sure that, for instance, uh, people could use the navigation elements without JavaScript, and we wanted to make sure uh, that we were in compliance with all the relevant state and federal laws, and we also wanted to do the right thing and have our websites be as good as they could be. So one of the things after that conference was I wanted to improve these navigational elements, uh, which leads us here today. Now, I'd like to point out that this project and presentation are based on the majority of the needs for sites currently in use at the University of Connecticut. So even if you choose not to use the specific approach uh, I'll show you, the basic ideas can be adapted to a wide range of sites. Now, Unless you're building a site which is only one page, people are going to have to find their way around. And not only that, but as a web developer, I know that if I put something or really anything interactive on a site, people are going to try and use it. So that means interactive elements may get used in ways that are unexpected or unfamiliar to me. As developers, just like we validate forum inputs because we can't anticipate every single thing someone might enter, we need to consider how people will use our sites besides with a mouse and screen. In terms of accessibility, this concept applies to visitors with permanent disabilities first and foremost. At the same time, some visitors may have a temporary or contextual accessibility need with respect to a site. Their mouse might break, they might be working on an airplane going through turbulence, their dominant hand might be broken, or maybe they visited an eye doctor and got their pupils dilated. We just can't know. 
we can't know the situation for every single person who visits us. But uh, we can try to design, build, and prepare sites in the most equitable ways we can. So how can we make sure this happens? Well, we try to keep our sites poor. You may have heard or seen this acronym poor in the past, but what does it mean in the context of a navigation menu? In my view, perceivable means if a visitor can physically see the menu, it must be visible or be able to be made visible. If that visitor can't physically see the menu, a screen reader should detect and announce items. For the menu to be operable, someone should be able to interact with it with the mouse and or the keyboard. If someone uses a mouse and there are submenus, they need to be resilient. That is, the submenus can't disappear immediately. Further, all the items in a submenu need to be reachable with a mouse or a keyboard. For the menu to be understandable, it should behave in a predictable way. Therefore, it needs to maintain visual and auditory consistency. For instance, if an icon toggles between two states, such as open and closed, it should do that predictably. Menu items should announce themselves in a predictable way for people who use screen readers. Finally, for the menu to be robust, in our case, we wanted to ensure that it would work at least to some degree without JavaScript. And this meant uh, keeping the style, the, the style and user experience approximately the same as if there were JavaScript available. In order to accomplish these goals, we identified three cases for menu items that are typical for the types of site we build. Overall, I think these cases are pretty common. First, a link by itself, which we can easily rely on WordPress to handle. After that, we identified two types of submenus. Those that have a link to a top level page with sub pages beneath and menu items that need to be, and menu items that need to solely act as a toggle to a series of sub items. These are fairly typical types of elements in a nav menu. Either you want to go somewhere by following a link, or you want to reveal more choices through some kind of toggling action. So now that we've got our goals through the POR acronym and our cases, we need to have a good idea of what elements are available to build with. So before we try to style anything or provide interaction, we need to get a handle on the HTML tags and properties we want and how are they are going to get rendered to the page. This actually has a massive impact on the overall, all the decisions that get made later. For instance, the style, JavaScript, everything else that comes after. If we don't have a good concept of what we have at the beginning and where we're trying to go, then we won't be able to add on. Fortunately, WordPress has a built-in way to generate a menu with the WP nav menu function, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this. The good news is that WP nav menu is easy to use and get started with. It accepts a list of arguments that provide a fair amount of customization quickly, and then after that, as soon as the page loads, it displays a menu. One argument which I tend to change immediately is the container argument. By default, the menu will be contained by a div. This isn't ideal for a navigation menu of this type because a div doesn't impart any structure or meaning on its own, but you can set the container to a nav element. When you do this, the final output of the menu will be wrapped in a nav tag. Browsers will then detect the tag and create an implicit ARIA role for it with a landmark. This is a useful accessibility improvement because a screen reader will have an easier time parsing the document's content. There are other arguments 
which you may be familiar with as well. For instance, you can set custom classes or IDs or set a theme location. And depending on how many navigation sections you have on the page, you might also set the container or ARIA label argument as well to further clarify the menu's purpose. Now, WP Nav Menu works really well for menus that have only one level of content. However, once you add depth to the menu, you'll run into accessibility issues. Let's take a look at how WP Nav Menu interprets each of the three cases I shared. Then we can see how we might improve their accessibility. The markup for a plain link is pretty straightforward. WordPress gives us just what we need, an anchor tag with a URL. This will provide a nice accessible link that supports people who use keyboard navigation and or screen readers. So far, so good. After this, things start to get complicated. In this case, we want to provide the ability to either click on a top level link to visit a page or access items in a submenu. As the markup is now, though, we run into a couple of things that could be better. First, the ARIA label attribute on the link takes precedence for screen readers over the content con inside of the anchor tag. So instead of a screen reader saying the inner text of the link, which is about us, it will say the value of the ARIA label, which is just submenu. That's not terribly descriptive because someone might want to click the link. Next, ARIA has pop up will announce to a screen reader that a pop-up is available, but we're missing supporting ARIA attributes to associate the link with a specific submenu and indicate if that submenu is open or closed. Last, depending on how the submenu is hidden and shown, there might be no good way for people who use a keyboard to get to it effectively. In addition, aside from showing the submenu when the mouse hovers over the list element, it's not clear how we can open the submenu. If we click on the link, it'll take us to the page and never open the submenu. If we just want the top nav item to work as a toggle, we can use a hash symbol as the link. Of course, then we need to use JavaScript to prevent it from reloading the page when the link is clicked, and this is something that internally at our department we wanted to avoid. However, if we get rid of the href attribute by removing any link from the admin area, the item can't be focused with a keyboard. Browsers will interpret anchor tags without an href property, like a span or any other inline element. So we can add non-JavaScript dependent toggles to the list of issues we need to handle. Now, I'd like to show you uh, what we'd like to add, how we're going to get there, and what the result is. At this point, what I wanted was a portable, flexible, robust set of choices to build off. That included things like being able to distinguish between links that go somewhere and toggles that don't, more ARIA attributes to support people who use screen readers, custom classes, icons, and so, <clears throat> and so on. WordPress does provide some additional filters for navigation menus, such as WP nav menu items, WP nav menu object filters. However, I wanted to be able to create the same kinds of markup across a variety of themes. For us, this would help with our brand consistency and visitor expectation from one site to the next. Fortunately, we can tap into and override the core class WP nav menu uses to generate the output for a navigation menu. We can do this with a custom walker class. To make it portable, we can then turn that into a composer package that can be installed from GitHub or Packagist. The project can then be used in many places. The walker nav menu class is part of a collection of walkers, which all inherit their functionality from a general walker class. Now, to be completely honest, when I started looking into this back then, the walkers were incredibly confusing. Fortunately, these classes take care of a lot of the work for us, though. For example, we don't have to worry about writing our own recursive functions 
to traverse menu structures since that's their main purpose. Rather, we can focus on logic for the markup our menu might need and what the output should look like. Once you write your uh, custom Walker class, you can then add it to the list of arguments used by WP Nav menu. When you do this, all the markup created by WP Nav menu will flow through the custom Walker. This means that you can override any of the Walker Nav menu's methods with your own, and that's what WP Nav menu will use. There are four class methods available, which will let you start a level, start an element, end an element, and end a level. In this context, we only need two of those, the one to start a level and start an element. Every item in the menu is going to pass through the start L and end L methods. These methods are uh, where we can add logic to support the type of markup we want to build. Consequently, the start L method was where most of the work for my custom walker happened. However, we're not just dealing with a flat menu. We need to be able to add depth as well. When we create a nested submenu, the walker will pass the output for the markup through the start and end level methods as well. These create the unordered lists. We can take advantage of that to affect how the submenu unordered list elements get created. In terms of accessibility, we can make sure we're adding useful IDs to each level, for example. By default, uh, WordPress um, wasn't doing this, or at least I don't remember it doing it back when I started this. It may do it now. This will let us match up the submenu to an ARIA owns property in the items markup. Now that we've seen the path the markup takes through the Walker class, Let's zoom in to the start L method where most of the logic happens. Here I've written out some pseudocode to describe the flow through our custom start L method. The shell of this is exactly what you would see if you took a look at the walker. We can start by checking to see if the current item has children. That is, should it be a link by itself or should it have a submenu with it? If not, if it's just a link by itself, we can output a, the start of a list item with a link inside and then finish. Otherwise, we need to know if the top level item should be a link or a button. If it doesn't have a link, we can output the start of a list item with a button on the inside. Otherwise, we need both a link and then a button as a sibling. This way we can account for all the cases in the markup. With this logic in place, we can also do things like add additional custom classes and data attributes. Those can help us style and interact with the menu more easily. Let's look at some examples of the output uh, that the custom walker I wrote creates. So here we're back at our plain link, but notice that we've added prefixed AM dash classes in addition to the standard WordPress classes. These will help designers and developers create styles specifically for these types of menus without relying on WordPress classes. There's also a Node.js class on the element. The Node.js class will be removed from the markup if the menu's JavaScript is available. If the JavaScript doesn't run, this class will provide a failsafe for opening and closing submenus, as I'll show soon. Here's how we can improve the markup for linked items with submenus. First, instead of the link ar link's ARIA label only saying submenu, it now describes the text of the link and gives a hint about how you can interact with it. You can obviously change this to whatever is appropriate for you. Next, the button is going to provide a semantically appropriate element that we can interact with whether JavaScript is available or not. We've also added a couple more ARIA attributes to it. ARIA expanded will indicate to a screen reader if the submenu is open or not. We can change its state with JavaScript later. Since we don't want any text to show on the button, 
we need to give it an ARIA label to provide context. If it's, th this is in case the button is focused. Inside the button, we can then make space for an icon. Here, we can use the ARIA hidden property. The ARIA hidden property will hide only the icon from screen readers, but still leave it visually available. Since we've created screen reader accessible text on the button with the ARIA label property and added the ARIA expanded property, we can use ARIA hidden to hide the icon without a problem. The ARIA owns property will associate the button with the submenu uh, that the, with the submenu with the ARIA owns property or the correct ID rather. This works in a way similar to how a label is associated with a form element. This is now markup that will let a visitor choose between clicking on a link or opening up a submenu. In the last case, there is no link for the item. It's replaced entirely by a button, so it can always act as a toggle. You can imagine that if you combine all these cases, you can start to get a very flexible and accessible menu. But we're not quite done yet. So far, we've made sure that people will be able to interact with the menu with a mouse, keyboard, <clears throat> keyboard and a screen reader. But now we have to think a little bit more about design and interaction. In our context, we wanted menus to work primarily through toggling actions. Actually, um, as I was writing this, I forgot one thing, and I added this slide today. So as I was preparing the presentation, I realized I had made a mistake. Uh, in the navigation menu, you want to have a current, the current page and or its top level parent visually highlighted somehow. And this lets people know which page is active. WordPress gives classes for this, but uh, also you want to make sure that the ARIA current property is set on pages. Prior to WordPress 5.3, I think you had to do this manually. Uh, typically you could check the nav, uh, you could do this with the nav menu link attributes filter. But in checking, this filter doesn't seem to work with the custom walker I created. I'm not entirely sure why right now, so I'm going to have to go back and refine it, but that's okay. I think the more important thing is to note that even while trying my best, I still ended up missing something by accident, which is all the more reason for me to keep learning and researching. Now, I'm not going to go over everything in the CSS for this project, but rather focus on CSS related to hiding and showing content. When we use CSS to hide and show content, our choices affect how people who use screen readers and keyboards can or cannot interact with web content. The ability to show and hide content is an important part of user interface and user experience design. This is especially true for navigation menus where we often want to hide or show content on hover or focus. If we're not careful, we can inadvertently use CSS to create an inaccessible experience for our visitors. So I think that it's important to understand the accessibility implications of how we use CSS to accomplish this. There are several cases where this chart is important. We might consider the case where a visitor who uses a screen reader wants to skim all the links on a site. We should be aware that if we use display none or visibility hidden, we'll be hiding content from them. Another visitor may come to our site and have an issue with motor control and browse with a keyboard. Depending on how we hide and show content, our choices may make that user experience more or less accessible. If the links in the navigation menu can be found in other ways or duplicated somewhere, that may not be a problem, but we should think about our choices and the overall context of the site as we make them. One of the design requirements, as I've said for our menus, was that submenus should be open and closed by toggle. The usual way to do this is with JavaScript so that when someone clicks on the menu item, the submenu is shown or hidden. However, we can't predict if people will have JavaScript available to them. Some people may choose to not use JavaScript. They may block it entirely. There may be a delay 
getting JavaScript to someone, or there may be an error that prevents JavaScript from loading correctly. If we're going to hide the submenus or content, we should still think about how we can give people a way to access those items. One way to do this is the focus within pseudo class, which I'll describe in a moment. You should be aware though the focus within isn't supported by Internet Explorer or non-Chromium versions of Microsoft Edge. According to the analytics I looked at for our sites, this represented a small percentage of our visitors. Further, this pseudo class will only be used in the event that JavaScript fails altogether. I think that the browser restrictions are a fair trade-off to get a very similar effect. Now, if the JavaScript does not run correctly, the Node.js class and its styles will be applied to the menu. This includes the focus within pseudo class. The Mozilla developer network says the focus within, quote, represents an element that has received focus or contains an element that has received focus. In other words, it represents an element that is itself matched by the focus pseudo class or has a descendant that is matched by focus, end quote. In plain terms, this means that even if a parent element can't be focused, if a child element can, the entire structure can be styled as if the parent can be focused. That's why it can be applied to the unordered list element instead of an anchor tag. Typically, unordered list elements can't receive focus, but because the list can contain an element like a link that can receive focus, the list will respond to the focus within class. Here's a small demonstration. The markup for each of these menus is exactly the same. You can confirm as much by going to the code pen linked in the slide. The only difference is uh, the use of the focus within selector. You can see that on the left, the submenu elements for uh, the about us menu item aren't reachable by keyboard. However, on the right, you can tab through them as you would the top level links. Here's an example in context. The admissions and about elements are links with buttons to toggle submenus next to them as siblings, symbolized by the carrots. Without JavaScript enabled, you can see how a visitor might traverse the menu items just with a keyboard. And of course, they can still use a mouse as well. There are still some improvements we can make to this though. For instance, maybe a visitor doesn't want to tab through every single item of every single submenu to find the one they want. In this menu, maybe they want to tab to the student life submenu without going through all the others. Now for that, we need to start talking about JavaScript. We can definitely get some accessibility improvements to this type of menu if we add JavaScript. In this project, when a button is clicked, the ARIA expanded state changes from true to false or vice versa. The CSS is then set up so that the button's icon will be changed depending on the state. This provides both visual and auditory context for site's visitors as they use the menu. However, one group that we haven't really talked about is developers themselves. We might create a plugin or a library that has technically excellent accessibility. But if it's hard for a developer who's beginning their career to use the JavaScript or CSS that's included, they may choose to avoid using the project altogether. The JavaScript, or CSS for that matter, for this project, doesn't require any additional dependencies or libraries. Not only that, but in the context of WordPress, the relevant script or styles can be enqueued directly from Composer's vendor directory. This means that developers don't need any additional front-end tooling or bundling libraries to get started. All that's required is that they follow a typical WordPress workflow to enqueue dependencies. Once the script is properly enqueued, it also has a very small external API. There's a configuration object, which only has two properties, both of which are optional. 
in order to use the navigation JavaScript, there's only one method you need to know. This means developers with a wide range of experience can use this in their projects. This approach may be less flexible than something with a larger API. However, I believe in this context, it's a good trade-off because developers with a wide range of experience will be able to use it more quickly. In fact, as a university, sometimes we have student developers who work on our projects. The init method in the JavaScript starts by defining which menu the JavaScript should apply to. It then removes the Node.js CSS class from that menu. Finally, it runs a method to set event listeners on the menu and the document. The set event listeners method attaches listeners to menu items and prepares them to pass events to an event dispatcher. The dispatcher determines the type of event and routes it to a particular event handler. Once the event is properly dispatched to the handler, it's responsible for the logic to set the state of menu items and properties. Depending on the state of the menu, event listeners are also added to the document so people can close open submenus with the escape key or by clicking outside the menu area. Here are two of the event handlers that are part of the JavaScript. They're divided so that they can manage mouse or focus events separately. Now, while I was working on the project, I found it was best to keep mouse, keyboard, and focus events separate from each other. That way I could handle exceptions for each type of event while encapsulating other parts of the code for reuse. One thing to note here is that these menu follow the disclosure design pattern for navigation menus. Now, as I understand it, in terms of keyboard support, this means that they're required to do three things. Move among items with the tab key, be able to select and activate items once they're focused with the space or enter key, and close items with the escape key. This is very different than an element with the menu aria role. The menu aria role requires more types of keyboard interaction, such as the ability to use arrow keys. However, in the example linked in the slide, well, it doesn't appear to be linked in the slide, sorry about that, we'll get that later. Uh, the markup is trying to create something more like an application menu for a text editor. If it turns out that I'm completely wrong about this and that I need to add more keyboard support to the menus, that's okay. The JavaScript is flexible enough to allow more types of keyboard events. The event routing would require only a few additional cases. From there, I could add appropriate event handlers without too much difficulty, I hope. In any event, I think it's always worth going back to review projects from the past and see how they can be updated. Earlier this morning, I read an article about WCAG 2.2, and for all I know, I'll need to bring this project up to date to conform at some point to that or a future version. In any event, here you can see the effect the JavaScript has on keyboard navigation. A visitor can now select among different submenus, however they like, with a mouse or a keyboard. Once the submenu is open, the next key press on the tab key will take visitors to the submenu. You can also see the relevant icon stays changed as well until someone leaves and closes the menu. This is done by tying the CSS to the ARIA expanded attribute of the toggle. Here are just a few resources collected into one place. I listed a few of the themes this project is part of just to demonstrate how it can be styled in different contexts. This variety is why I wanted to make sure that the project was portable and which is why I, we chose to bundle it as a composer package. I thought it would also be helpful to give a few code resources and documentation as well. You can browse the repo we use and if you like contribute to help improve it. So to wrap things up, there's still quite a lot to do, even after so much time. Web accessibility standards continue to be updated and refined. Plus, as I've shown, there's at least one thing that I've missed and need to revise. So personally, I wanna make sure that I stay informed and engaged with issues around accessibility so I can be of service to the people who visit us. So to finish up, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here with me.
And I'd also like to thank everyone involved with today's conference for giving me some time to share this with you all. Um, if you have questions, I uh, am more than happy to answer them. Let's see if I can stop the screen sharing. And uh, um, I can turn my camera on, right? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. There Here we go. I did that. Okay. Hey. Hey, it's good to see you in person. Nice to see you in person uh, in the in the interwebs, as it were. So yeah, um, great talk. Uh, very Thank informative. Very um, what is the pro project license? What's the open source license? Is um, it MIT GPL? You know, I don't remember off the top of my head. It is probably a very broad, <laughs> yeah. broad license. Yeah, I mean, this, this was basically. Um, this was basically, we looked at the websites that we had and realized that these, beyond just ordering things with proper, uh, you know, H1, H2, H3, right? There were some broader issues involved that at a technical level we were gonna have to deal with. And this was the first one I wanted to tackle because it seemed like it was going to be one of the most difficult. Um, so I think the licenses, if I even wrote one is very, broad yeah fair, fair enough i always just find that interesting uh how people license things um but anyway i'm a geek so uh we have some questions and okay. if you still have questions um please put them into the chat and kayla our chat moderator will send them over to me and then i'll say them out loud and then adam will answer them so our first one is is a mega menu accessible accessibility suited or can it be made usable if so, can you describe or provide a sample? So I think, is a mega menu accessible or can it be made accessible? I mean, I guess that would entirely depend upon whether or not it conforms to WCAG standards, right? So can you navigate the menu using a mouse and or a keyboard? Uh, does it respond appropriately to a screen reader when you do so? Um, so for instance, my, j just so you all know, my reference point for screen readers is the Mac OS screen reader. Um, I honestly, I don't have JAWS or anything like that. Um, and we don't really have the, have, have that kind of material where I work. Uh, but I try to use the Mac OS screen reader as best I can. I would say that yeah, you should just be very careful in the case of a mega menu because you may inadvertently hide um, content that you would rather have people get to. Um, yeah, so I think that what you should do in the case of a mega menu is try to navigate the site with a screen reader and see what happens if you, like, can you actually get to any of the items? Um, can you get to the items if you only navigate by keyboard? Yeah, and I think that will be the, determinant if it's accessible or not better than me just giving a broad, you know, yes, they are, no, they're not. Yeah. Sure. Our uh, next question is, um, how have you found the experience to be for voice command users when using error label to provide the accessible name? Uh, so is the question, I guess I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Is the question, do, does it read the name appropriately? I think so. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I believe that it reads, last I checked it did. Um, I mean, it's certainly, we don't have anything that responds to voice commands uh, in these menus. Um, certainly, I, I don't have the background to handle that. Although, if it's something that I need to do, I can certainly start looking into it. But as best I know, uh, and the last time I checked, yes, they, they all read correctly. And our last question, and if anyone has a last minute question, please put it into the chat now and we'll try to get to that, um, uh, is menus seemed um, a web feature that hasn't gone away over time with mm. skip nav and one page sites becoming more prevalent. Do you see them being phased out for simple, more accessible experiences? Oh, that's actually really interesting. Um, <sighs> So we definitely use skip nav. Um, I'm not, I have no information about how many people actually use that. Um, as far as single page sites go, uh, 
you know, I think there's a big difference between literally a single page, which is like a brochure and a single page application site, which is a more a larger scale or, or something like that. Um, in the latter case, or in the, in the former case, rather, a single, literally a single page. I, yeah, I'm not quite sure why you would necessarily need a navigation. Um, you might just have like some links at the top that would jump you up and down. Uh, in the latter case, I'm not sure. I think that some applications and site are so complex uh, that you wouldn't necessarily need them. I think the only thing that I would say is lots of people now get to sites just by Googling the information they want. Um, and then my intuition is that if for some reason the content doesn't make sense or is structured in a bizarre way, then they might need to use uh, more navigational elements in order to find what they're looking for after the fact. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, um, again, I just want to thank you so much, Adam, for sharing your expertise. Um, are you, uh, you listed your contact information on the slide. And if you want to get yeah. those slides, you can go to wpaccessibilityday.org to download all of the slides. Um, and find out information about all of our speakers and our wonderful sponsors. Please continue the conversation on Twitter. Our hashtag is WP Accessibility Day and hashtag WPADA2020. And our Twitter account is WP Accessibility. Please, at the two o'clock UTC hour, please join me um, and Christina Workman, and she's going to talk about accessible websites benefit everyone. Um, and again, just a big thank you to our chat moderator, Kayla. Um, she is uh, stepping away and we get in a new chat moderator at the next hour. But again, thanks, Adam. And thanks everyone for watching and being part of WP Accessibility Day 2020. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much.